Okay, so our first standard is professionalism, and this is the standard of professional behavior for, for all members in their work-related activities. And the key thing you want to keep in mind is you need to know the law for where your firm is headquartered. So if we're talking about City, Citibank, they're headquartered in New York. Then you need to know the law of where you are working. So if uh, you're working for City, Citibank, but you're located in Bhopal, India, you need to know the laws of the uh, province of Bhopal, India. And then finally, you need to know the laws of the CFA Institute. And then, with whichever of the laws are the strictest of all of those three entities, those are the ones that you want to follow. Because if you follow those, you're going to follow the, the other two. Okay? And that's the key point. And that's what you will probably be tested on. On almost every test that I ever took for the CFA, there was a question on that. So you want to know this topic. And a couple of other key points to just keep in mind. We're give, we gave you some examples. Um, but if you want a more comprehensive view, make sure you read the uh, CFA Institute or the notes. And then the other thing is that um, I'm referring to uh, members uh, and candidates, but from now on we're just going to use members um, and that will be inclusive of both members and candidates. Okay, so keep that in mind. Okay, so here's an example. A member discovers that his firm is using uh, misleading advertising about investment performance. Should he report it to the regulators? So the answer is first, if the regulators um, require it, meaning that uh, the law requires it, yes, you report it to the regulators. If you have questions, you need to go to your legal department, your compliance officer, and report the situation. And then finally, if you believe that this conduct is continuing and you see that it's continuing, then you have to disassociate yourself from all that conduct. And if you have to, you have to say bye bye and disassociate or leave your job, which in these circumstances is not easy. So um, the next example, which could easily occur is that a, a member notices that um, a broker is generating a lot of new business for the firm while also getting payments for research. However, the broker doesn't seem to be providing any research. So what does the member do? Well, first, from a regulatory standpoint, if um, this is against the law, then you should go to the regulators. And the, the next thing, um, you probably uh, should, the next step in the chain is you're going to deal with your compliance department. And they're going to give you some guidance about what to do. Now, if the firm continues with the same situation and doesn't do anything, you have to, again, disassociate yourself from the situation. And finally, if it continues beyond that, you again have to leave the firm. So these are the preferred uh, steps that you would take. Okay, so with respect to these, uh, the standards, show independence and objectivity in his or her work. Members should not be influenced by gifts, bribes, etc., but their work should have integrity. Should. Okay, here's a great example. A member who works as an independent analyst, supposedly independent, writes a report on a firm. His contract specifies that he will be paid more if his report results in new equity sales by the firm. In this case, this independent analyst has an incentive to write a report where the report conclusion results in a favorable recommendation that gives him more money. Okay, so number one, this uh, member A has to disclose the payment in terms of the contract and B, they should not be engaged in any kind of contract like this because here the incentive can change the analyst's recommendation or outcome and anything like that is a violation of the code. Okay, so anything that changes the outcome is no good. So just keep that in mind. Incentive is a big deal. You want to make recommendations based on fact and they have to be your honest recommendation. And they shouldn't be influenced 
and, sh and cannot be influenced by any kind of incentive or payment. So here's another example. Member B and member C are researching a firm big and traveling to a city where they stay in a motel. Now, B lets the firm big pick up the tab where C insists on paying for it himself. Now the key point is, is that B gets paid by the firm, but the, if the accommodations are not extravagant, they're modest, okay, and they don't, they don't cost a lot of money, and they don't affect his recommendation, that'd be okay. Now C has no problems. He's not getting paid, he picks up the tab himself, so you know that his, his analysis, hopefully, you would think, is going to be honest and his actual opinion. B has the issue of, because he accepted a payment, the question is, does the payment affect his recommendation and is the payment modest? So those are the things to keep in mind if you have an example like this. And the CFA tests are typically loaded with these kinds of questions, so you want to make sure that you have an understanding of these kinds of examples, okay? Here, the standard is members should not represent. This can be a lie and omission of relevant fact or words designed to mislead. Plagiarism is misrepresentation too. So the first example is, and you see this all the time, okay? A member recommends stocks on their website, but he does not disclose that it receives commissions. There are all kinds of newsletters. There are people who come on television, especially CNBC. Maybe they're part of an investment bank and they, um, are doing an underwriting and they do not disclose that they're, um, they have some incentive to recommend a firm. That is a breach of this particular standard. Okay? Anytime you do not disclose what material interest you have, that can affect things. And you see this all the time, it's huge in finance, and you should always in your, the back of your mind, you should uh, be skeptical of what's going on, okay? The next thing is a firm has overstated performance to a prospective clients due to a typo. Well, what should happen? You should send out a correction to your clients. So these kinds of things happen all the time in finance and you have to be aware of them and you're gonna get tested on them. So make sure you learn that. Okay, so here, it's, the standard is the members should not engage in misconduct like dishonesty, fraud, deceit that reflect poorly on the member's professional integrity, good reputation, and competence. And anything here that doesn't pass the smell test that's even close, should, there should be bells going off in your head, okay? So here, here's the example. A member has acquired a reputation for hard drinking that often extends to lunch hours in his interaction with clients in, in the afternoons. It is sometimes obvious that he's intoxicated. So it doesn't have to be just drinking. It could be somebody who takes drugs or somebody who just behaves poorly. Anything that, that reflects poorly on the profession or misconduct, that's a no-no. Okay, so here are some more examples. A member inflates his travel expenses and submits bills to his firm that exceeded the amount spent. He's not being honest, uh, that's misconduct. Simple, straightforward. Um, another example, a member takes part in protests by animal activists and is arrested by the police. Uh, civil disobedience is okay. There's no misconduct here, there's no violation. So this is kind of a tricky one and you may see something like that on the test, so keep that one in mind. This um, standard has to do with the integrity of capital markets. Members should not trade or cause others to trade on material non-public information, such as information about earnings, mergers, new products, stock splits, change in management, possible bankruptcies, orders for large trades before they're executed, front-running, etc. There are always examples of people who are trying to take information and uh, benefit themselves, and anything that, that can affect the value of the investment is applicable. So you have to really watch things when it comes to the test, when it comes to uh, what exactly is material non-public information and how does that affect the value of the investment. And then the other thing here to, to consider is the capital markets with respect to the benefit of society at large. If 
The capital markets don't work because people don't have faith in their integrity. Society at large cannot benefit from the positives of the capital market. So these are the things to consider when you're talking about the integrity of the capital markets. Okay, so this idea of the mosaic theory. The mosaic theory is that an analyst can gather information from all kinds of sources. What might, be the, what might they be? They may be websites, they may be newspapers, they may be 10 Qs or annual reports, they may be from customers or suppliers, or any, all kinds of places that analysts get information. And they compile this report. Once that report is compiled, it may be a material report because it can move the price of the stock. Now if a coworker comes in and steals the report, he is in violation. So this analyst has gone through all this effort to create this report and get all these sources and get all this information. So he creates his report. Now the analyst is allowed and it's okay for him to act on this resort using the mosaic theory because he's got all this information that's um, public information and it's non-material. But again, if somebody steals it from him, then they are violating the principle. So the person who does the work and gets all of the information, provided that it's uh, non-material and um, public, that's okay. Okay, so here the example is an analyst speaks with uh, various customers and dealers, dealers of a firm auto and discovers that the auto's recent models have been poorly received by the public. She also finds that the auto dealer stores are shabby. She writes a report downgrading the auto stock before she mails to her clients. A coworker enters into her office. In her absence, reads the report and places a short sell order. Now the key point here is that, the, again, the analyst or the clients who get the report, they can trade on this information. The information is material and it's non-public, but if this person, who, this co-worker who stole the report, if they trade, then that would be a violation. So you have to distinguish between the client and the analyst who are doing things um, above board and the co-worker who certainly is not. Okay, so in this example, in a restaurant, a member overhears some employees of another firm discussing material, non-public information. The member is not connected professionally with the firm. The member commits a violation if they trade on that information. If it is material and you trade on it, that's a violation. That's the key point. Okay, so this standard is a member should not manipulate the market. What is market manipulation? It can be uh, buying or selling securities with the purpose of just changing the price of the security. Market manipulation can also be information based, for example, by spreading rumors. Financial markets work based on information. And if you're trying to manipulate the capital markets through manipulation of security prices or manipulation of information that affects security prices, that is a violation of this standard. Okay, so here we have a couple of, of examples. The first, an exchange in, introduces a new product, enters into agreements with brokerage firms in which they commit to a minimum number of trades of the new product. Key point here is, is that should disclose this to Clients, if they disclose it, this is not a violation of the, of the principle, okay? The second example is a member contracts with a firm to provide it publicity for a stock and cash compensation. She sends out emails praising the stock's prospects and posts on various websites. Clearly, this is market manipulation and this is a violation of the integrity of the capital markets. This is a cut and dried case, okay?